morning and welcome to our worship this morning, Sunday the 12th of July. Apparently I said the 14th last week, sorry about that if it confused you. Today is also the Sunday that is designated as Action for Children Sunday, so I will be including a prayer for them. Action for Children is the children's charity of the Methodist Church and I'll put a link to their website where you can find further information and make a donation if you wish. And so we begin our worship. Rejoice, there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We sing our first hymn, Sing of the Lord's Goodness. Let us pray together. When the seeds of new life are sown, let us praise the Lord. When crops ripen in the field, let us exalt our Maker. When the wind blows or the snow falls, let us draw close to God. Lord, for all your gifts in creation, for the gift of each other and the gift of the church, we offer our thanks. Most of all for the gift of Jesus who went about among us as teacher and friend, who lived, died and rose again, we offer our deepest gratitude and amazement. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take a time of quiet to bring to mind the ways in which we feel we've let God or ourselves down during the last week. Lord, when we are slow to listen, forgive us. Lord, when we are hasty in our actions, forgive us. Lord, for the things we have done that we should not have done, forgive us. Lord, for the things we have not done that we should have done, forgive us. Rejoice. For in Christ we know that our sins are forgiven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now we hear our readings for this morning, first from Isaiah 55, 10 to 13, and then from Matthew 13, 1 to 9, and 18 to 23. The Lord says, 
The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honour to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. The Parable of the Sower That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears then, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and who receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Thanks be to God for these readings from his word. This short passage from Isaiah tells us that God's words are like the seeds planted in the earth, being watered and making it sprout food to nourish those that receive it. And that those so nourished will go on to accomplish God's purposes, which can be seen in the rejoicing of all creation. Jesus may have been thinking of this passage when he also talks about his words and how they are like seeds being sown, which when they bear fruit, allow God's plans to be accomplished. They enable the kingdom of God to bear fruit as he has described in earlier chapters. But this is also a warning against allowing those seeds to be prevented from bearing fruit. And he said there are four things that can happen when a person hears the words of Jesus about the kingdom. The first is represented by the seed that falls upon the path. A path 
is a hard, barren place for a seed to try and grow. It's more likely to bounce off than to find the nourishment that it needs. Jesus says the seed on the path represents those who hear it but fail to understand it. Perhaps you are someone who has never had much time for faith and so you've never allowed yourself to listen to what Jesus has to say. Maybe you think that you're doing okay and you don't need God in your life. But the challenge is to really think about why we are here and how the wonder of creation that's all around us came to be and continues to provide for all that we need. The most important decision that we have to make in life is whether or not to put our faith in God. Because either he exists or he doesn't. It has to be one or the other. If he does, then everything we are and do has meaning. And we need to take notice of what he tells us. God calls us into relationship and to a Christ-like way of life. There is life beyond all that we can see. But if he doesn't exist, then finding meaning in life is much more difficult. There's no joy or pleasure or hope greater than what you can see. This is all that life has to offer. But accepting God may be only the first challenge. Then you need to explore what God is asking of you and your life. In this, we can begin by exploring the teaching of Jesus in the Gospels. So the second thing that can happen to God's word is that it falls among the rocks. This represents the person who hears, accepts and grasps God's words with great enthusiasm. But they have no root. As soon as the troubles come, the difficult questions, the hardships in life, then the person falls away from faith. But Jesus never said that following him would be easy. He never said, follow me and everything will be fine. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus never promises that if we follow him, we will not, tra ple we will not face troubles and hardship. What he does say is that he will always be there with us in those troubles. That where life is at its toughest is where he is to be found. The third place that the seed might fall is among the thorns. This is where his word is choked away by the lures and distractions of the world. We might have heard the word of God at Sunday school or at church and then gradually Things like sports, shopping, DIY, car boot sales, even family life, or the lure of wealth come along. None of them bad or wrong in themselves, but when we allow ourselves to become so totally distracted from God's word that we cease to hear it altogether, then we are caught up in the thorn bushes. The kingdom of God fails to make progress through the word that has fallen among the thorns. So maybe at this point, some of us are feeling rather smug. We went to Sunday school. We've been going to church all our lives. We, surely, must be the seed that fell on the good soil. Well, that's not necessarily the case, I'm afraid. The question is how well we have enabled the kingdom to grow through the seed that was planted with us. The church exists as a place for the seed to be sown, nurtured and harvested. And it may contain seed from all four of those groups. A church is a bit like the soil in the parable. So that others may grow in the faith from the youngest to the oldest. It seems to me that this sower isn't a very good farmer. His yield would be much higher if he fenced off the path cleared away the rocks, pulled out the thorns and so on. Preparing the ground first, nurturing the seed carefully. And so I challenge you to think about your church. What is it that's hindering growth? Which paths need fencing off? Which rocks need clearing away? 
which thorns need pulling out. How can we make the church a place of good soil that grows new Christian people? This present time of forced exile from our building should have taught us something about what is important for our churches. The buildings have been closed, but the church has continued. We've continued to worship, to pray, to reach out, to preach the word. What we haven't been able to do is to meet one another in fellowship, but much of what the church exists for has continued. As we begin to start to think about how we emerge from lockdown, we're encouraged to consider these questions. And the first one is, what have you learned during lockdown as a church that excites you about worship? What have you learned about evangelism and building relationships with new people? And then, what have you not grieved for or missed as a church during lockdown? What might you decide not to pick up again? How have you perceived God's presence and hiddenness? What has lockdown taught you about the foundations of your mission as a local church? I'd be interested to hear your views on these questions and perhaps use them to inform um, an update of our mission planning in the weeks and mo months ahead. So do get in contact. Amen. A prayer for Action for Children. Lord, we lift up the work of Action for Children. We think of all the families who come into contact with the charity and pray your blessing over them. We think of those struggling with their physical or mental health and pray your peace descends on them. Lord, remove any barriers that may prevent people from reaching out. We thank you for the thousands of staff members and volunteers who serve children and families and pray that you would sustain them. Give them the energy and enthusiasm they need to lovingly support those most in need. We thank you for the infrastructure that makes Action for Children's work possible. The buildings, the vehicles, the IT, all the variables that help them to reach and serve communities across the UK. We pray for the leadership and the trustees. May your wisdom and guidance be present as they map out the future of the charity. We pray for our wider society. We ask that your will be done from Westminster all the way down to our communities. We ask that lives led by love Love, modelled so perfectly by Christ, transform the world we live in. In the name of the King, Jesus. Amen. And we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We join together in the words of the hymn, Let us build a house where love can dwell. Faith and vault of grace, you give love 
of Christ shall gain divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true. you've enjoyed our worship this morning and we conclude with a prayer of blessing. Dear Lord, when times are hard, walk beside us. When we are unsure of the way to turn, dwell within us. When we need to listen to others, encourage us. When our lives and work bear fruit, rejoice with us. So may the blessing of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all today and evermore. Amen. Amen.